Hello everyone and welcome to another with Electronic ISOs webinar in partnership with On Semiconductor. My name is Marcus Ebele and I will moderate this webinar today. We are very pleased that you took the time to participate in our webinar. The topic of today's webinar is onboard charges, technical requirements and market overview. Our speakers today are Mike Bracken, who is working as technical marketing engineer at OnSemi, and Hussam Ben Jake, who is working as product definition engineer at Wilf Electronic ISOs. They will hold today's webinar and also answer your questions. Before we start with the presentation, I would like to point out one thing. You will be muted during this webinar today. This means that you cannot ask us questions via microphone during the webinar. Nevertheless, you have the opportunity to ask us questions during the webinar at any time via the chat function. You will find the chat function in the webinar control panel. Today's webinar will be about 30 minutes long. The chat questions will then be answered in a question answer session following the webinar. There are 10 to 15 minutes in addition scheduled for this. And if we are unable to answer all your questions within this time, we will answer them via email after the webinar. And if you still have any other questions left after the webinar, just email us at isos-webinar at we-online.com. We will try to answer all your questions promptly. You will also receive the link to the presentation as well as to the recording of this webinar only in the next few days. So, and now I will hand over to our speaker, Mike Bracken, and I wish you an exciting webinar. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> for my portion of the presentation today, a quick agenda, we're going to do a quick intros, uh, give you a high level overview of uh, OBC and some trends, uh, talk a little bit about on semi components for onboard chargers and where you can find them on our website, which has been recently redesigned. Uh, we'll talk about some reference designs uh, and material that we have related to onboard chargers um, and then a quick call to action. I have embedded uh, links in this presentation. So as Marcus said, when it goes out, you'll have uh, pretty easy access to this info just by clicking the hyperlinks. So quick intro about myself. Uh, I joined On Semiconductor in September 2020. I worked at Automotive Tier 1 for about nine years. I was a field applications engineer for over 12 years at two other companies uh, covering a variety of customers in automotive, industrial, and white goods. Um, as far as automotive tier ones and OEMs, I've dealt with applications in powertrain, vehicle electrification, et cetera, um, covering customer sites in North America, Europe, and Japan. Uh, for ON, I'm currently focused on vehicle electrification. And then uh, my contact information is on the right. I'm located in Michigan in the United States. Um, real quick, drop for our, our new website. Um, our previous website was challenging, I'll say, to navigate. Um, we've been updating it. You know, Not every section is updated. However, the vehicle electrification uh, area or solutions area of our website has been updated from a taxonomy and layout. Um, most of these applications have been updated with updated block diagrams, as well as links that directly link to parts that are relevant for the specific solution, making it easier for engineers and system uh, integrators to find components that meet their requirements. Uh, so the whole layout was refreshed um, as well, and I hope you guys are able to use this in order to help yourselves with your designs. We are obviously working on more uh, content and additional sub-solutions, but this is currently what it looks like um, in the vehicle electrification area. So OBC overview and trends. <laughs> First of all, what is an onboard charger? Um, you know, the onboard charger is an automotive module that basically allows the battery pack in a plug-in electric hybrid vehicle, uh, battery electric vehicle, or even possibly a fuel cell electric vehicle to be charged from an AC source. Um, in China, these are all grouped under new energy vehicles as well. Um, the OBC design is affected by power levels, the type of AC input, uh, the battery pack voltage, cooling methods available, and space constraints. Um, another one that's not mentioned but is quite obvious is you know, cost targets. The OBC module takes in that AC power and provides DC power as an output. Um, and in new bi-directional designs, it can actually take the DC power from the battery pack and convert it back to AC power. What are the high-level functions of an OBC? 
So within the OBC, the high level functions are, you have AC rectification and power factor correction on the incoming AC source, which creates a high voltage DC link. You've got a primary side DC DC. You have secondary side rectification, which might be passive for unidirectional. It can actually be active as well for syn synchronous rectification, or it could be active um, if you're truly doing a bi-directional solution. Um, you're gonna have additional things monitoring voltage, current, and temperature. You're gonna have some type of in-vehicle networking communication interface, most likely can. Um, you're gonna do communication to the EVSE, the electric vehicle supply equipment. Uh, you'll have to provide a bypass if the charger is capable of doing uh, DC fast charging for the uh, battery pack, there will be a bypass of the OBC because obviously the OBC isn't needed for something that's a direct DC input. And uh, another key safety feature of OBC is it's gonna provide isolation between the AC source 12 volt battery and uh, the high voltage battery, regardless of whether or not it's 400 or 800 volts. Uh, this is what I'll call an OBC representative block diagram. Obviously, you know, customer designs are gonna vary quite a bit. Um, the intent of this is to really drive discussion and help people find our solutions on our website. So this is a block diagram that was updated recently and you'll find on our website under the OBC section. Uh, anything that is shown in burnt orange color is something that on semi supplies today. Um, so you can see that when you look at the general OBC architecture, probably the only thing we don't really handle at the moment um, for automotive is main microcontrollers or a diagnostic microcontroller. Um, we do have PFC controllers inside on semi, but they're currently not automotive qualified. That'll possibly change in the future. Um, but everything else that's shown here is something that we readily supply today uh, for automotive customers. So some of the trends, uh, OBC designs are clearly moving towards higher power levels as well as the higher voltages, um, you know, 800 volts rather than 400 volts. Um, there's even systems where uh, an example actually is in America, it's kind of a, a crazy thing to think about, but the electric Hummer, uh, the GMC Hummer uh, has a, a system where it can charge at 800 volts, but then it operates at 400. Um, you have a variety of designs for single phase AC as well as three phase AC inputs on OBCs. Um, and they can handle both 400 volt and 800 volt battery depending on the system design. Um, I believe these will continue to coexist for quite some time because there's different cost targets, different system level requirements that may not drive everyone to go to that highest voltage. Um, you know, three phase AC inputs for OBC, that's not something that's available everywhere uh, worldwide. Um, Certain countries in Europe have three phase available at residential locations, but uh, in the United States, for example, there's typically only single phase AC at residential uh, locations. Um, Bidirectional designs may become more prevalent to allow vehicle to grid power transfer. Um, and then of course, owners will be compensated when providing that power back to the grid, or they can use it to provide power to their own homes in a, in a uh, say an electrical brownout or, or blackout. Um, the one thing that's really interesting to, to note is with all the, the changes in corporate and government opinions, uh, as well as you know personal changes as far as personal opinions go, uh, the growth rate's looking really good for OBC. It's compound annual growth rate right now in volume is estimated to be 25.6% over the next five years. And this is just another thing that kind of shows the growth rate in volume um, as far as split between plug-in hybrids um, and battery electric. You know, fuel cell electric, it's it's kind of, <clears throat> I get conflicting information on whether or not it will be common for OBC to be in these types of vehicles. However, you can see that if it is there, it's still pretty minimal volume. So it really doesn't affect the numbers a whole lot, but you're looking at well nor well over 20 million units by 2026. And with, you know, current things, the way they've been shifting, it's, it's quite possible that'll be much higher, who knows. So what are the on semi components for OBC? <clears throat> First, let's go back to the block diagram. <clears throat> when you talk about the PFC and the DC-DC power path, which is the first section we'll talk about, you've got AC rectification, power factor correction, um, your primary side and secondary side, you know, DC-DC and rectification. Um, those power switches will be driven by isolated gate drivers, PFC controllers, LLC controllers. Um, you may need gate drive isolated supplies, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, 
But nevertheless, these are the components you would have. There are the optional BJT buffers, which some customer use if they want to increase the output current of the gate drivers. But obviously, the desire is to have the, the gate driver itself capable of that higher level current. So what you'll see for some of the OVC common PFC topologies, uh, starting at the lower left for very, we'll say lower power designs that are, are more cost optimized, maybe not looking for the highest efficiency, you're gonna have something along the lines of traditional boost PFC. Um, the AC rectification will still be a diode bridge. You'll have a boost PFC controller, probably single channel, but again, lower than 3.3 kilowatts typically. Um, the next step up to the, the right would be uh, a traditional boost, but now you've got two channel interleaved PFC. So still boost um, for the PFC topology, um, still AC rectification through a full diode bridge, but now adding multiple channels to improve the uh, ripple through the PFC circuit itself. Um, I've heard of some implementations of actually a three channel interleaved boost, but I don't see it very often and I, I get a lot of feedback that it just doesn't make sense from a cost perspective, but it could be out there. And then bridgeless PFC is the next, or bridgeless boost. Um, you essentially get rid of you know, a few of the diodes on the AC input, which improves your efficiency and voltage drop. And then you move over even further to the right for totem pole, which gets rid of all the diodes. Um, these are, are the, we'll say less than 7.2 kilowatt types of inputs um, for, uh, could be single phase or three phase AC depending, but the, the diagrams here show three phase. So if we jump up to um, what I'll say are higher power and three phase input PFC implementations, you're gonna have the standard Vienna rectifier as well as there are implementations of this that are slightly different. And then you can also have a three or four leg bridge, which is basically a three phase totem pole. Um, again, getting rid of the diodes. So just so everyone's familiar with that and has a quick reference as far as common PFC topologies. Um, we actually uh, also have you know, a few different common DC-DC topologies that you'll see in OBC. Um, these tend to be the three common ones. You've got LLC at the lower left. Um, you'll have CLLC as you move up to bi-directional and then uh, what's called dual active bridge or DAB, D-A-B. So uh, you can see that all of these have multiple power switches. Obviously, as you move up and you want to have bidirectionality, the number of power switches increases as well as you add power switches to the uh, what we'll call the secondary side or the side that's the battery side, the right side in these diagrams. So just showing that to, to give you an indication of where these different power switches would be. And quickly stating, you know, some of the products for these OBC systems in general, when we talk about it, you're looking at um, power switches, we have IGBTs, silicon superjunction MOSFETs, silicon carbide MOSFETs, as well as automotive power modules that integrate multiple switches into a specific package. Um, transfer molded packaging is, is something that we do quite a bit of for this space in, in XEV. Um, we have gate driver ICs that cover all the standard uh, technologies, IGBTs, silicon superjunction MOSFETs, and SICK MOSFETs. Um, we have power diodes. Um, SICK diodes and automotive power modules for diodes are our strong suits. The silicon diodes, we don't really have high current silicon diodes on semi. We have high voltage with lower current, so that can be useful for some of the other circuits we'll talk about. Um, analog signal chain, op amps, current sense amplifiers, comparators, temp sensors, VREF, um, ideal diode controllers to help draw, uh, reduce the voltage drop to your low voltage circuits in these designs if needed. Um, a lot of different power supply ICs, controllers, converters, and LDOs. We have a very strong LDO portfolio for automotive. Um, IVN, CAN, CAN FD, as well as system basis chips. Uh, EEPROM memory, which is uh, very high reliability and best in class. Uh, digital isolation, which is coming out shortly, um, as well as the, the things that I think on semi tends to be widely known for in a lot of spaces, you know, the discrete components, BJTs, diodes, low power MOSFETs, and new logic ICs. Let's talk a, a quick bit about uh, auto modules <clears throat> or APMs. So these, uh, this is an example actually of a thermal image kind of in the middle. And uh, can I change this to, there we go. So this is a thermal image of one of our transfer molded packages. Um, you know, the, the benefits are, are highlighted here. You're gonna have increased electrical performance because you get higher current capability lower inductance, lower resistance. Um, you'll get better EMI performance with these packages in certain instances. 
uh, as well as you know the the standard um, integration with multiple dyes in one package. Um, you tend to get lower thermal resistance, um, a smaller overall footprint compared to discretes, um, and then you know lower power losses. These have been used in automotive from on semi specifically for over 12 years now in various applications. Um, you know there are instances where it makes sense. I would say the higher power classes. Um, I do think that lower power classes are probably still best served by discrete components. However, if you're really trying to push the limits of the design, as well as minimize space, you may still consider APMs for those smaller power levels. Um, this is an example just to show the size difference. Um, this is not an OBC per se, but it's good for the, the reference point. Um, ASPM, so that's slightly different from APMs. ASPMs, they actually integrate the gate driver IC as well along with the power switches, um, but it's still good for the, the general idea of understanding how it shrinks the, the design. Um, so what you have here is the top and bottom side of an ASPM solution or what's called an automotive smart power module with those integrated gate drivers. And then here's a standard IGBT solution with external gate drivers. Um, so just there to show the difference. I mean, it's pretty substantial from a size perspective. Um, and oh, by the way, the thermal performance should be much better. So some of the things you'll be looking for when you talk about gate drivers, you're gonna want, um, you know, obviously a, a specific source and sync drive strength. Um, if you have an IGBT, you're gonna be interested in, in specific protection functions. If you're gonna have a sick MOSFET, you're gonna have different, you know, functions that you require as well as su silicon superjunction. Um, you know, the timing, propagation delay, delay matching, blanking, all of that stuff can be important based on the design targets. Um, and then we already talked about protection functions. So, you know, when you're looking at components for the high power path, obviously, you know, to address automotive, we have to have AACQ 101 qualified components. Um, actually, the automotive power modules are also AQG 324 qualified, which is the automotive uh, packaging tests that you need to have for those types of packages. Um, we have, you know, the variety of technologies from IGBTs to, to superjunction MOSFETs to SICK MOSFETs, as well as the APMs. Um, it really allows you to be scalable and address the full range of power classes in your designs. You know, we have um, various solutions for 400 volt and 800 volt across the different technologies. Uh, we have silicon carbide MOSFETs and diodes at 650 and 1200 volts, IGBTs that are also at 650 and 1200 volts. Um, we provide bare die um, as well as very high power packages. Something I'd like to mention about the SICK in, in, in general is that now we are end to end fully integrated. Uh, as a silicon carbide provider. We acquired GT Advanced Technologies recently, um, and we can handle basically crystal growth to discrete components and power modules all in-house. Um, you know, for the IGBTs, we have options with co-packaged diodes, uh, low VE SAT, low E off, E on, um, low VF, soft recovery, et cetera. So you get reduced conduction losses, reduced switching losses, and easy paralleling. APMs. Uh, currently released, we have 650 volt APMs. More on that coming for higher voltages in the future, of course. Um, but again, just to highlight what APMs give the design, you end up with lower strain inductance, possibly an integrated snubber for improved EMI. You know, very low thermal um, performance or very good thermal performance with low R theta. Uh, you have the power FETs, possibly diodes integrated in these. They're all different, so this is kind of a, a general summary. And I already mentioned the automotive power module qualification. Uh, super, super junction MOSFETs, uh, we have over 30 devices offered in TO247 and TO263 package options for the higher power applications. And gate drivers, you know, the driving efficiency for some of our IGBT, IGBT gate drivers is 15% better uh, that, than the competition at the Miller Plateau. Uh, we're continuing to grow the isolated portfolio. I know some of our parts have been out there for a while, but we have several new parts that have been releasing and several more coming, uh, along with um, continuing coverage for IGBTs, but we're releasing these new parts for MOSFETs and silicon carbide MOSFETs as well. So where would you find this? If you're on our webpage, uh, you go to the solutions area, automotive vehicle electrification, you can either click on this uh, diagram on the onboard charger button, or you can navigate through the power tree or the power tree, <laughs> the tree, the menu tree on the left side. Uh, and then you'll get to the different areas by clicking on related products and scrolling down. All of this has been set up in order to provide you with just automotive parts for this application.
Um, similarly, we have the analog signal chain parts um, and regulated power. So why would you consider on semi for the power tree and analog signal chain? Our LDO portfolio is very wide. Um, we have low RMS options down to 4.4 microvolts, um, excellent PSRR greater than 90 dB, there's a typo there, um, as well as very low IQ options. Um, we have several new LED LDOs that are 150C junction rating, uh, as well as more coming. Um, we have several updated options for isolated auxiliary power supply ICs, and I'll cover that briefly with one of the reference designs we have, uh, the NCB1362 IC being an excellent fit for isolated power from the 400 volt or 800 volt battery. Um, we have pin to, pin to pin compatibility with certain competitor ICs, multiple SBC options. And then the analog signal chain, I don't know that people think about on as much about this, but we've been working on this quite a bit. We have the NCV2191X. Uh, it's an improvement to better parts at zero drift compensation. Um, we have very high speed comparators that are on par with everybody else. We have CSAs that are actually perfect clones as well as more cost effective than their competitors based on customer feedback. Um, and we have a new part, the NCV7041, that gives you a wider common mode voltage range. Um, it can be used for low side sensing in high voltage applications. Um, so it's not a, an isolated op amp, but it does give you more margin on the negative voltage specification down to negative five volts for low side sensing as compared to the ncb 21 x And again, you'd be able to find these on our website by navigating here. Communication and other discrete parts are what people tend to refer to as popcorn parts. I think that that a lot of times on semi, this is what people have thought of. I think that you know we're we're growing quite a bit in the power switch space. We have a lot of business there. Um, but it's my job to make sure everyone's aware of all of our different options. So um, going back to this, this is something I think we tend to be more widely known for, um, you know, BJTs, other discrete components, small signal diodes, senior diodes, um, you know, soon to be digital isolation, BJT buffers. Um, you know, EEPROM, if it's used in your design, we have a, an extremely high reliability EEPROM, uh, AEC qualified for grade zero options, very high temperature, four million write cycles. It's it's best in class as far as um, you know the industry goes right now. So you know when you when you think about the popcorn components or communication, you know still we want to be considered. Um, you know we have a new generation CanFD uh, component, um, continuing to develop our Can portfolio. You'll see that there will be options for isolated Can in the future, possibly some some Can sick for higher bit rate. Um, I was mentioning EEPROM. Uh, you know, it's automotive grade zero qualification, 200-year uh, data retention functionality up to 175 C. It's better than every competitor in the industry. And then, of course, the small signal diodes, protection diodes, glue logic, BJTs, uh, as well as SBCs. And you can find those here. Uh, there are a couple that are still missing based from the website updates that haven't been implemented. Those links are shown below, basically for timing, logic, and memory, um, as well as discrete power modules. So, and then the last thing we'll talk about are our reference designs. So we have several reference designs provided for customers to kind of jumpstart their situation or their design. Um, you know, when you look at electronic systems in EV, all of them other than MHEB have some high voltage power net. Um, what does this mean? You know, systems in XEB need a low power isolated auxiliary power supply to deliver regulated DC voltage, either from the, the 12 volt, the high voltage battery or both in some instances. Um, I've even seen requirements where on a, a mild hybrid design, which only has 48 and 12, um, there were still isolated auxiliary power supplies. And I know that varies quite a bit, but I have seen it. Um, so there are instances where they can be incorporated even on an MHEV targeted design for 48 volt, 12 volt. But the isolated auxiliary power supply, what I'm talking about first is the kind of the main DC-DC that comes off that high voltage bus. Um, you know, the generic requirements can be 250 to 900 volts. Um, you know, for 48 volt systems, it might be 24 to 54 volts. The output power is somewhere between 15 and 150 watts. That's actually grown quite a bit over the last several years. Um, and V out might be 15, 20 or 24 volts, some kind of intermediate voltage that the remainder of the power supply ICs will be daisy chained off of. Um, it's almost always a flyback topology. So we have a, a reference design at 15 watts developed uh, using SICK. It uses the NCV1362. Um, and again, it can handle 250 to 900 volts. It outputs 15 volts, and then it's got 15 watt total power, um, an isolation level of 4 kV. So this is a reference design that you can click on. 
um, these links right here, and you can actually purchase this specific board um, if you wanted to evaluate. And this just shows the efficiency figures uh, over the full load range. You can see that uh, you know at the lower voltage, you're achieving almost 88%, which is very good for an isolated auxiliary power supply that covers this full voltage range. Um, even when you're up to 900 volts, you'd still be above 78%. We also have a 40 watt version of this. I won't repeat all the specs, but it's essentially the same. So 40 watt, 15 volt output, same input range. Um, and again, here's the efficiency. You have a 40 watt and at uh, 250 volts, the low end, you're over 86%. Uh, when you're at 900 volts, you're still over 82.5%. Again, very good for an isolated auxiliary power supply that, that it works over the whole range. You may also have um, isolated gate driver power, depending on the topology of the design. So we have a reference design for that as well. Um, these are also purchasable and the link is in the top right, but this is a IGBT isolated gate driver supply, 1.5 watt, 15 volt output, as well as negative 7.5 volt output. Kind of comes with a bonus positive 7.5 .5 volt rail as well that you could use for additional power should you need. Um, we have a SIC isolated gate driver supply, 1.5 watt, 20 volt output, negative five volt output as well. Um, and then it's got a bonus positive five volt rail. Again, the link in the top right, you can find on our website. These are hyperlinks to these designs, um, just making it easy so that when you have the presentation, you can easily click on them and find them on our website. And then these are actually hyperlinks to the specific products that are used in those reference designs, at least the power supply controllers, the NCB 1362, the 3064, as well as some useful application notes. Um, we have additional upcoming primary side regulated products as well for 12 volt isolated power in XEB systems and even more coming out for the high voltage ones. Um, quickly, we'll talk about a reference design for an 11 kilowatt onboard charger. Um, this is an 11 kilowatt OBC. It's got three phase AC input. It's implemented using three leg bridge PFC as well as an LLC DC DC. Um, it uses SIC MOSFET and diodes, can handle 195 volts AC to 265 volts AC. Um, and the output is from 200 volts to 450 volts uh, with I out zero to 40 amps. Um, we have quite a bit of documentation for this. Um, here's some pictures of the test boards we made. And then of course you can click on this hyperlink and you will find all the relevant information on our website. Uh, there is a GUI. If you were to build this board, you could actually use to load the software. It's not something that we support directly, but the GUI is there to allow you to basically exercise the hardware. This is not something that's purchasable on our website. If you have interest in it, please contact your uh, FAE or salesperson for more information. 6.6 .6 kilowatt silicon carbide based onboard charger reference design. Again, the link is here. Um, you know, essentially, it's a single phase input, 6.6 .6 kilowatt. It's got a three channel interleave boost. So here's an example where they did this on the PFC. Again, I don't know that I see this a whole lot, but uh, it's interesting to evaluate for this particular application. It's got an LLC, DC, DC, and then synchronous rectification. Um, you know, the specs are here for input and output. And uh, again, lots of documentation when you go to our website for this. Uh, additionally, we have a three channel interleave totem pole PFC reference design. Uh, so this is just the totem pole PFC. It is not the whole OBC. Um, you essentially have sick MOSFETs for the high speed, high speed legs, and then it uses a super junction MOSFETs for the low speed leg. Um, you know, again, applications would be automotive onboard charging where you want that totem pole PFC. Again, clicking this link, you'll find all the information on our website. And then the uh, resource summary, you know, for the different OBC reference designs that we had to quickly go over with some quick highlights on what they're capable of for input and output. These are all hyperlinked, so you can find them. And then uh, some additional resources for um, reference notes and et cetera. And then there is a 3.3 kilowatt OBC design. Uh, there's no web page for it, but the documentation is shown here in case you're working on those lower power designs. And then the uh, simple call to action, you know, please use the links for the updated vehicle electrification solutions area of our website. Um, they're included here. Um, this hyperlinks back to the different reference design landing pages that are included in this document. And then obviously, if you have additional questions, you know, contact your local field sales engineer or field applications engineer if you have questions. Um, other than that, 
uh, for my part of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for your interesting presentation. Um, yeah, I would give uh, over to Hussam so we can go on with his presentation. And then after this, we will go on with the um, yeah, with the question and answer session. So yeah, Hussein, we can see your screen. I think that's set up everything. Perfect. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mark, for the extensive presentation. Um, from my side, my name is Hussein Benchek. I'm a product definition engineer specialized in, in custom magnetics, uh, and I work uh, in Rotary Electronics since 2018. And today I'm gonna present to you uh, the topic of onboard charger with an emphasis on the custom magnetic. So, yeah. what do we have in the agenda today? I'm gonna quickly give you an overview about the EV market situation and why Rotary Electronic is interested to have products in there. And uh, I'm going to uh, go on afterwards to talk specifically about two um, custom magnetics that were used in um, on semiconductors reference design, which are the PFC inductor, uh, as well as the gate drive transformers, and um, how we got from custom magnetics to um, coming up with the standard families. So first of all, quickly um, a graph about um, um, the size of the global market. Uh, for electric um, vehicles in 2020, as you can see, um, the the overall revenue in billion dollars is around 171 billion dollars, which is uh, quite something. And uh, the forecast for 2026 is also four times uh, what it is in 2020. Uh, so that's um, one of the reasons why Rotary Electronic is trying to get in there in this particular market. And these values do not actually take into consideration um, all of the the infrastructure behind it when we talk about onboard and offboard chargers, etc. So with the electrification of the automotive market, um, there is an, um, a clear need on with for OBC and EV charging stations. Um, it's kind of an imperative. And uh, the main requirement uh, here is, uh, we're talking here more about uh, higher power and fast charging time. And to do so, Magnetics are a critical component uh, to ensure the highest efficiency and the best uh, power density. Um, yeah, other possible applications. So the same parts that goes into these EV onboard and offboard chargers. Uh, we're talking here about, for example, the PFC chokes or LLC uh, transformers. Um, um, they go also uh, well in other applications like solar inverters, ACDC for data center communication or industrial motor drives. So these type of versatility for these products also um, take our interest. Um, yeah, let's uh, actually start with, uh, with the PFC inductor. As uh, Mark already mentioned, he went extensively on the topic. Uh, but as he already mentioned, the first stage for an OBC is uh, most time three, a three-phase PFC board uh, that has uh, basically the functionality of rectifying the input voltage uh, and providing the uh, providing uh, the input voltage provided uh, by the main, by the by the by the source, and um, uh, keeping, of course, the PFC factor as close as possible to one. And to achieve this, um, the PFC choke needs to basically fulfill um, specific requirements. Um, you can see on the left the bullet points that we got from the application engineer working on um, the 11 kilowatt um, PFC uh, board. Um, and um, so then we were basically trying to achieve around uh, 330 microhenry of conductance value um, with current capabilities of 14.5 amps as RMS, 16.5 amps as peak current, and a peak to peak current of 4 amps. Temperature range is uh, pretty standard. Uh, here, the key parameter is to try to achieve as, as much uh, an overall uh, efficiency as possible. The target was about around 98% um, for using, of course, the high current uh, and at a frequency of 100 kilohertz. So uh, trying to have as low parasitics uh, as possible and uh, to work on um, the AC losses uh, of, of the PFC choke and to try to uh, lower them uh, to achieve the efficiency requested. 
So, um, well, the best way to fulfill those requirements um, was to go for a toroidal version of these TFE chokes. Uh, as you can see in the picture on the right side, um, um, so we decided to go for a flat wire technology um, to achieve high current capabilities. And since you're working on high frequency, you're talking about 100 kilohertz here. Um, the flat wire technology goes well uh, hands in hands with that uh, to suppress, for example, uh, parasitic light skin cracks. Um, you can see in the first picture um, that the sample that uh, we are showing here is a very preliminary sample. It was developed without a mechanical solution and uh, sent to the application engineers uh, for testing purposes. Uh, the second, the, the picture just below um, show um, a plastic case that we made uh, with our 3D printer to be able to make it easier to, for the engineer to mount this, um, these chokes on, on their PCB. And um, yeah, uh, the main we, we tried to, uh, to have a product that will have as low thermal resistance as possible, that, radi that has a, a magnetic radiation has um, um, magnetic field radiation quite low compared to the current uh, the current the, the current that are going through these inductors, and as you can see, quite compact uh, design and easy uh, to mount. Um, I'm showing later on uh, here the data sheet of the product that uh, was a, was a sent to uh, to Ansemi. As you can see, in um, the size we're talking about 72 by 72 millimeters. Uh, the inductance range is about 360 microhenry with 20% tolerance, so we're still in the range of 330 microhenry. And um, as you can see uh, below, it's not that clear, but you can see it, uh, that we were able to achieve the current uh, capabilities needed here, which are rated current of 15 amps and saturation current of 24 amps. So. Um, uh, well, I might, uh, let me say that after successfully proving uh, this inductor um, and the, the preliminary uh, design that I was showing you before uh, on the on-semi application, the 11 kilowatt uh, PFC plus LLC board, uh, we, we've seen good results and we've seen also a ramp up in the market demand on these particular chokes. So we decided to develop an inductor family dedicated uh, for these PFC high power application. Uh, so the picture on the right shows a 3D model of the mechanical solution we decided to adopt, which is, well, basically two, met two metallic surfaces with a screwed in, uh, with, a, with a screw. Uh, the inductor uh, successfully passed the vibration test as well as the ACQ rounded qualification overall. In the picture on the left, you can see uh, different saturation currents for the different part numbers we're planning to launch uh, with an inductance value that goes from 170 to 510 microhenry and uh, saturation current goes from 10 to 100 uh, amps. Um, you can see um, here um, the table basically of the, pro of the different components that you are planning to launch uh, for this WEPFC standard family. Uh, as I mentioned already, inductance values, we have like five main uh, values, um, 170, 180, 255, 340, and 510 microhenry with different sizes. And we're planning to show in the data sheet um, the rated current value about um, four different uh, values according to the airflow situation uh, that is going to be used since this particular product um, are going to be used, as I mentioned, either in OBC or in uh, off-board chargers, where the thermal, thermal behavior is quite critical here since we're talking for the, in the example of an onboard charger, for example, we're talking about a big um, board with a, high, uh, with a high power output that is going to be in box, that is going to be inside the box. Uh, so um, the airflow, um, um, uh, basically the thermal um, behavior is quite important and it's important to have these parameters here. The last column is basically saturation current uh, with um, um, with an um, inductance uh, loss of three of, of thirty percent, and as I mentioned already, the saturation current goes from ten amps to hundred amps. Um, now I'm going to move to um, the topic of gauge drive transformer, as Mark already shown some of the reference designs. Um, well, uh, first of all, on on the picture on the on the right, I'm basically showing the gate drive uh, power stage. Um, yeah, it, it, um, um, I just wanted to give an overview 
um, about the different blocks. They have basically two main blocks, an isolated gate drive IC with an output transistor stage, um, well, whether in push-pull or in totem pole, depends on the configuration, um, used to, to drive the, the gate source of the, of the SIG device here. I took the example of the SIG device. Um, based on, on the PWM and the input. And um, um, the lower power uh, isolated auxiliary supply, which is the part that is interesting from, for us as a passive manufacturer. Um, typically a push-pull, a half bridge, or a flyback uh, uh, topology. Um, so um, provides um, the positive and negative output uh, rail um, for a faster turn off uh, transition. Um, and in addition to the um, two windings that the gate drive transformer provides uh, uh, for the positive and negative voltages to drive the SIC um, drive or the SIC uh, switcher, the transformer assures galvanic isolation between the high and low voltage side. And um, actually, this is a requirement not only to meet the safety standard, but also to uh, reduce the electric, uh, electrical noise, um, as well as to improve the EMI and even the gate drive control um, robustness. So um, the requirement from OnSemi for their reference design um, were the following. Uh, here I'm talking about um, the auxiliary power supply for, gate, for a SIG um, um, drive uh, that Mark already sh um, have shown in his um, reference design section. Um, the topology here is a flyback um, uh, primary side regulation, actually um, going, uh, working on, on both um, continuous conduction and discontinuous conduction mode. Um, primary inductance is about 42 microhenry uh, with an output voltage um, of um, um, minus 5 volt and 20 volt to drive the SIG uh, MOSFET and um, a plus 5 volt winding for the auxiliary power rail. Um, a very important and critical parameter here is the very low parasitic capacitance and the gate drive transformer. Um, the application runs under a switching uh, uh, in a switching frequency of around 150 kilohertz, and the electrical uh, the electric isolation required here is about 4 kV. Um, we were also requested uh, to have a transformer that is compliant um, um, uh, compliant to the safety standard IEC. Uh, 62368 minus 1 and IEC 61558 minus 2 minus 16. So, uh, um, um, in this slide, I actually wanted to um, explain a bit why is interwinding capacitance or parasitic capacitance quite important uh, for the definition of the transformer and for the well being, for the well functioning of, uh, of the gate drive circuits in general. Uh, and to do that, first of all, let me um, uh, let's understand what does a CMTI stands for. Well, CMTI is uh, short for Tama Mode Transient uh, Immunity, as uh, written on the right. And it's basically the maximum DVDT that can be applied across the isolation barrier before malfunction actually occurs. So, um, since our auxiliary power supply, uh, as we already mentioned, is um, a flyback converter, well, we're going to use then a transformer for the for to convert the energy and the parasitic um, capacitance exists across the isolation barrier so um, the high dvdt appearing across the, the this capacitance this cpt uh, will basically generate what we call a displacement current uh, idt with the formula on on the right um, and uh, the displacement current IDT um, between the high voltage power uh, converter side and the low voltage control uh, controller side can actually distort the signal um, 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 going through and uh, even can compromise basic functionality, like uh, basically uh, losing the, 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 the control of, of the SIG uh, MOSFET. Um, so, um, uh, to to summarize, I can say that to basically minimize the, the displacement current, we have to minimize the the, the interwinding capacitance or the parasitic capacitance, and this actually can even enable uh, us to go higher into in, in the switching frequency, which are which is one of the main advantages of using uh, SIG devices. I wanted also to. Um, um, to say uh, that, um, or to, to emphasize on the fact that the high DVDT is not only applied between the switching node and the DC node, like DC power or, or system, or like the GNG, as, as shown uh, in the blue uh, blue arrow, 
but uh, also between uh, the high DVD team Italic node and the separate board and Earth uh, potentially like connected to to the chassis. Um, so uh, this will actually generate um, from the from the, the displacement current. It will generate common mode displacement current across the isolation barrier, and this will actually affect the EMI performance uh, overall. So uh, basically, having low parasitic capacitance with will also result into a higher impedance presented uh, to any common mode noise uh, current coupling between uh, high volt and low volt side. Uh, so basically to summarize, minimizing displaced, um, displaced uh, displacement uh, current and common mode current uh, will um, result into better control robustness and um, better EMC performances. So this is the uh, reference design that Mark already showed in his uh, presentation. I'm also showing it again um, using our um, gate drive transformer. And uh, in the data sheet, as you can see, we were able to, um, uh, uh, to come up with a design uh, in a very interesting and appealing uh, package, uh, EP7, quite small, um, inductance value of 42 microhenry in the primary side, as I mentioned saturation current of 1.2 and the interesting factor here is of an interrunning capacitance of around 6.4 picofarad very small compared to uh, traditional transformers uh, and as I mentioned already um, uh, these transformers are um, uh, complying to the safety standard requested. So um, same with the with the same with the with the PFC choke. We did the same thing with the with the gate drive transformer. After having a successful experience with the reference design and with the custom transformer, we decided to go for a standard family uh, that is called the WE AGGT WE uh, auxiliary gate drive transformer. Um, and yeah, um, this particular family is already online. You can find it in our website. With, we have until now six different um, part number, but uh, these part number are going to be extended in the future. Uh, and you can see in the electrical parameters um, that uh, these uh, parts are uh, suited to drive both uh, SIC, um, IGBT, and even GAN uh, transistors um, with a very low interrunning capacitance that goes from 6.8 to 8.2 picofarad. Uh, operational uh, frequency is around 300 kilohertz and um, uh, these uh, components enable a high CMTI over 100 kV per microsecond and as you can see uh, there is a different a huge difference between using these particular components and a regular transformer in terms of interwinding the capacitance. Um, these components as well as the WEPFC as I mentioned are ACQ200 qualified um, uh, they are also uh, compliant to the, to the safety standard that I mentioned with the appropriate uh, creepage and clearance distances. Um, uh, also, um, the transformer are using fully insulated wire and they uh, ensure uh, an isolation of up to 4 kV. This is uh, all from my side. Thank you, uh, everyone, for hearing this uh, short introduction, and uh, we're looking uh, forward for your questions. So, thank you very much for your interesting presentations. And yeah, as you've mentioned it, now we would like to turn our attention to your questions. So we wait a little until some questions come in. But I just saw there is also there are also some questions coming in in the meantime. Um, I think we can start, Hussam, uh, there are, is a question for you. Um, are the WEPFC jokes available online and why are there parts with the same size and same inductance but different saturation current? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let me start with this one. First of all, um, the WEPFC are not yet um, uh, online. Uh, they, you cannot find them in our website, but you can get in touch with us, uh, with an FAE or with your sales contact to ask for some samples. Uh, unfortunately, these parts are a bit expensive in terms of size. They are quite heavy, um, uh, so uh, they probably would be difficult to get them uh, for free as samples. 
Um, regarding the second part of the question, yes, you are right. There are some components that are with the same inductance value, same rated current, same size, but with different saturation current. And this is basically due to the fact that we are using different core materials to, um, to enable different uh, higher saturation currents. Uh, of course, using different core materials will, um, will uh, result to a more expensive part. So we give both options. Okay, thank you for your explanation. Then I think next question is going out to Mark. Um, are there ESPMs which are comparable comparable with the SIG MOSFETs? And does it make sense to change them or are there any negative results? For example, an 1.2 kilowatt uh, class. So good question. Um, <clears throat> on semi has all the different technologies currently in-house. Um, there are certain things that are maybe not fully publicly available yet that I wouldn't be able to talk about. However, if, if you look at what we have from an industrial standpoint, um, as well as you know the technologies that we offer already, it, it's clearly obvious that this will be an area that, that will be addressed, um, you know, so, Silicon carbide is a strong area for on semi in general. Um, you know, when you talk about ASPMs versus APMs, I wouldn't be able to tell you what, what you may see first, but obviously these are all of interest to our company. Um, so whether or not we come out with the versions that have the integrated gate drivers or just the APMs that have silicon carbide within them, um, I would expect to see a, a scalable offering, let's put it that way, across the different voltage classes. Okay, thank you very much for your explanation. Yeah, then let's go on with the next question. Uh, are there LCs, LLC transformer also designed by Wolf Electronic and why can we see three different magnetics on the LLC platform? Um, yeah, if we're talking about the 11 kilowatt, I think you're talking about that one. The 11 kilowatt that was shown by uh, Mark in this presentation. Yes, uh, they were designed by Virtual Electronic. I had, did not have the time to honestly go into detail since it's a, a long presentation. Um, but um, we are seeing three components because, uh, well, for an LLC topology, you know that there is a resonant tank. Most time um, uh, to make things easier, we use a single transformer with a high leakage um, for, for as a, to, to not use an external uh, resonant inductor. Uh, in this case, we did not, and we actually split the transformer in, in two uh, because we did not want to have a component that is quite bulky, quite noisy, uh, very expensive. Well, sometimes splitting uh, into three components might be more expensive, but in this case, uh, basically, the size, the overall size was not the main purpose. We were trying to approve the concept, to have a proof of concept, so we tried to go for the easiest solution and the more efficient uh, solution. So that's why you can see two LLC transformer plus uh, an, um, a resonant inductor. Okay, thank you very much. Then, yeah, just a hint from my side, uh, as we discussed uh, or already mentioned it, you will receive the link to the presentation as well as to the recording of this webinar only in the next few days. And Okay, then I would say let's go on with the next question. I think it's also the last question I can see for now. Um, also, Hussam, addressed to you, how are you able to achieve such low parasitic uh, capacitance? For the WEAGDT, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, well, um, basically, uh, we uh, migrated to a fully automated uh, process, but something I can say. Uh, the other thing is that, yeah, we for, for sure we're using fully isolated wire, as already mentioned, so that contributes to that. But yeah, there is, uh, of course, a know-how from Virtual Electronic on how to address these type of topics that uh, would be uh, counterproductive, I'll say, to, to express. But yeah, mainly those main, two main reasons are behind uh, the fact how we can achieve such a, an inter low interwinding capacity. Okay, thank you very much. So now we are finished with our webinar. If there are any questions on your side after this webinar, you can also just email us at the email addresses you can see now. 
So thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoyed our webinar. Also many thanks to you, Mark and Hussem for your time today. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Mark. Thank you everyone. Yeah, then uh, just have a good rest of the day and I hope you will hear us at our next webinar again. So thank you and goodbye.